or solve rational equations and inequalities. So we're looking at the same types of equations we've looked at so far, the reciprocal of linear, the reciprocal of quadratic, and then uh, in the form f of x equals ax plus b over cx plus d. Either way, you're going to have a polynomial uh, in the denominator in order to create a rational function. And today we're adding in, okay, what's the solution look like if it has an inequality rather than an equal sign? But before we do that, you have a little chart to fill in. Uh, we're going to start with the general form of the reciprocal of a linear. That is, I mean, the general form of a, of a line is y equals mx plus b. So really you just have 1 over and you could do ax plus b or mx plus b um, whatever allows you to create that generic form f of x equals and then for a specific example uh, I'm gonna write 2 it could be something as easy as g of x equals 1 over x minus 2 or it could be something like h of x equals uh, negative 3 over x minus 5. You could, have, you could even add like a 2x minus 5. Just give yourself a couple of examples that shows something very simple and then something a little more complicated. Then we have our reciprocal of a quadratic the general form could come in a couple of forms again you can uh, as long as you have the quadratic in the denominator you can have a quadratic that's ax squared plus bx plus c or you could write uh, the general form in factored form which is what we kind of aim for right uh, x minus r x minus s that gives us more information about the graph. And then for specific examples, again, you could use uh, standard form. Maybe you have something like h of x equals negative 1 over 3x squared minus 5x minus 2. And maybe you have an example in factored form. Say you have 2 over x plus 2, x minus 1. And then the last form we've looked at so far, or I guess, yeah, so far, is f of x equals ax plus b over cx plus d, which I believe is written there for you. And we've learned a lot about what that graph, the graphs of those types of functions look like and how to get some of the key information. And then we could give a specific, again, it's any, any, uh, this example is just x to the first degree. So it's a linear over a linear. So you could do something like 2x plus 5 over x minus 2. Okay, as far as key information goes, one of the things we talk about is horizontal asymptotes. Uh, but there are different cases to consider. So in a rational function, you have a polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator. And the asymptotes behave differently depending on the degree of this polynomial and the degree of the polynomial in the denominator they will interact with each other differently depending on their degree. Okay, so some of the cases that we need to talk about. If the degree of the numerator, so if the degree, I'm just gonna put this up here, numerator, denominator, to give us something to talk about. 
if the degree of the numerator is less than the denominator. So let's say the top was a linear equation and the denominator was a quadratic, or the top is just a number, like number one, two, three, whatever, and the bottom is a linear. If the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, um, then we have a horizontal asymptote. So that on the right, I guess we could give a, to a couple examples here. So that would be something like f of x equals 2 over x plus 5 or g of x equals maybe a linear 2x minus 2 over uh, a quadratic. Okay, so in either of those cases, the denominator, the degree of the denominator is higher than the degree of the numerator. This is going to give us a horizontal asymptote uh, of y equals 0. So it's going to give us a horizontal asymptote right along the x-axis. The x-axis is the horizontal asymptote. This is case 1. Case two, the degree of the numerator is equal to the degree of the denominator. So if you have a quadratic in the top, you have a quadratic in the bottom. Uh, and if you have a linear in the top, you have a linear in the bottom. A couple of examples. Again, you can come up with your own examples, but there's one. Uh, here's another one. Okay, cubic over a cubic, a linear over a linear. This is where you get into that situation where to find the horizontal asymptote, you're going to first divide each term, divide each term by x, then sub x approaches infinity. So you're going to see what happens as x approaches infinity. Okay? And the y, uh, the intercept, sorry, the horizontal asymptote will be y equals that number. Whatever the value of the function is approaching as x approaches infinity positive and infinity negative, that will be the value of the asymptote. And that'll make more sense maybe as we do a few examples. Case three. Case three, the degree of the numerator is one greater than the degree of the denominator. So the degree of the numerator, uh, let's say if we had a quadratic up top, x squared plus 2x minus 5, and then the numerator would have to be linear, x plus 2 we'll say or something like, uh, well, whatever, we'll just leave one example there. You can write more examples if you want. I have a quadratic over a linear. You could do a quartic over a cubic, as long as the difference between them is only one degree, one power of x. So you have a, a x to the power of 2 in the numerator and x to the power of 1 in the denominator in my example. This is going to create an oblique asymptote. Uh, will create an oblique asymptote. I'll explain that in a second. So an oblique asymptote is one that will, it doesn't run straight across. It won't be perfectly horizontal. Instead, it will follow the equation of a line any which direction. Okay, so an oblique, you can kind of think of it as a diagonal asymptote. But an oblique asymptote uh, defined by y equals mx plus b found by long division. 
So basically, if you did this division, the result, the answer, the quotient <clears throat> would be a, a linear function. So no matter what, if you're only one degree higher in the numerator than the denominator and you divide it out, the result will be a linear function. And that linear function will be the equation of the asymptote. So if you divide this out and you end up with, uh, you know what, the quotient is 2x, it won't be, it'll be x, let's say, plus 1, okay? Then x plus 1 would be the equation of the asymptote. It would be something like that. And then your function would look something like this. You'd come down and it would go up. And then it would come up and go down. So the uh, function will follow that asymptote. Okay? They start to look really fun. Good. And case four. In case four, you have the degree of the numerator is two or more greater than the degree of the denominator. Good. So case four, the degree is more than one greater. So you'd have something like a cubic in the top and a linear in the bottom. That's a really simple one. Uh, but it could be anything else. It could be x times x plus 1 times x plus 2 times x plus 7 over x minus 1. Something like that. Or even 2x squared minus 1. In this case, there is no horizontal asymptote. and no oblique asymptote. Is it like kind of use like, like follow? Okay, so the four cases that we're looking for are the uh, case one where you have the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the uh, denominator. That's going to look like the things we've already dealt with quite a bit. Okay, then you have the case where they are the same, in which case uh, also we dealt with that a little bit with the, the rational functions in the form of ax plus b over cx plus d. The things that are new today are the oblique asymptote, where the numerator is a of a higher degree than the denominator, and then this place where there are no, asym no horizontal or oblique asymptote uh, if the numerator is more than one degree greater than the denominator. Okay, friends, you get this uh, rational equation. You've got 4 over 3x minus 5 equals 4. You're not sure what to do, uh, but you apply your mad algebra skills and you multiply both sides by 3x minus 5, which on the left side cancels out and leaves you with just 4. And on the right side, leaves you with 4, and then in brackets, times 3x minus 5. But now that we have lost our denominator, it's harder to see our restrictions. So right away, in this step also, we're going to list restrictions. That's kind of a step that uh, is always happening. But basically, in the equation, we've already learned something that x cannot be, because the denominator can never equal 0. So in this case, uh, if we you know, add 5 to this, this can't equal 0. 3x minus 5 can't equal 0. Okay, so x cannot equal 5 over 3. And we're going to take that restriction all the way down with us to the end. Uh, we can finish this out by simplifying... On the left side, we still have 4. On the right side, we're going to distribute the 4 to both parts of the binomial. You get 12x minus 20. We can add 20 to both sides. 24 equals 12x. Divide both sides by 12. x equals 2. And we're going to rewrite our restriction that we found. And you don't, uh, you don't actually need to for this one. 
because x doesn't equal anything except for 2. If x equals 2, if you were to get some uh, a linear or a quadratic or some kind of curve as the answer, then you would need to keep that restriction in here. But we know that this is a vertical line at, uh, at x equals 2. Okay, that's what the graph would look like. So we don't actually need to take that restriction all the way down into our answer. Next one is slightly more involved. We start with x minus 5 over x squared minus 3x minus 4. That is equal to 3x plus 2 over x squared minus 1. What are we doing with the x, plus two, x equals 2? Like what does that mean? Like so what? that is the solution to this equation x equals 2 that's the solution that's what makes that's the only value that makes this statement true okay that's all we're yep. looking for yeah solving uh, in our first steps here okay uh, one thing that we do when we're working with fractions or when we're working with polynomials is we like to cancel things out so if you for instance find something that's in the numerator and the denominator we can cancel it out okay so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to factor any expression that can be factored okay uh, in the denominator usually you're going to be factoring so we're going to here we're going to factor the denominators factor the denominators well what does that look like we have x minus 5 stays in the top on the left and then on the bottom we're looking for two numbers that will add to negative 3 multiply to negative 4. That is x minus 4 and x plus 1. On the right hand side here we've got 3x plus 2 and here we have a difference of squares x squared minus 1 so that results in the product of a sum and a difference x plus 1 times x minus 1. And at this point we want to list our restrictions. factor the denominators list restrictions so what can x not be uh, so that our denominator never equals zero well here we have x can't be negative one can't be positive one and it can't be positive four and that's kind of a we wouldn't write it that way we we'll go x can't be one x can't be four so now what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, each side okay we're going to look at the denominators the factors in the denominators so we have three unique factors we have x minus 4 x plus 1 and x minus 1. Those are our three unique factors. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to multiply both sides of the equation by those three unique factors. Okay, we're going to multiply both sides of the equation by those three unique factors. Uh, what that's going to end up, let me just pause, is canceling out all of the things in the denominator. Okay, so if we, I'll try and write it, uh, well, let's say, multiply both sides by x minus 4 times x plus 1 times x minus 1. So let's look at this left side. What happens if we multiply it by x minus 4, x plus 1, x minus 1? Well, all of those factors are going to go in the numerator. It's going to end up the x minus 4 in the numerator and the denominator are going to cancel out. The x plus 1 in the numerator and the denominator are going to cancel out. And the only thing you're going to be left with in the numerator is the x plus 5, x minus 5, sorry, that we started with, and a factor of x minus 1. Does that make sense? If that's not making sense, I'll rewrite that whole little step. OK, 
Okay, so what you're going to end up with, and I'll probably erase it for the sake of space, but anyway, you've got x minus 5 up there. You're going to multiply it by x minus 4, x plus 1, x minus 1. And in the denominator, you still have x minus 4, oh, I multiply it by like x plus 1. Three factors. So because we want to be able to cancel out the denominator on both sides. So look at what happens on the right hand side. You still have 3x plus 2, but then you're going to multiply by x minus 4, x plus 1, x minus 1, still over x plus 1, x minus 1. But now look at the cancel out. Over here, x minus 4, x minus 4, x plus 1, x plus 1. All that's left in the denominator is 1, a factor of 1. Anything over 1 is just itself. Similar thing happens over here. x plus 1 cancels out x plus 1. x minus 1 cancels out x minus 1. And all you're left with on the left is x minus 5, x minus 1. And on the right, you're left with 3x plus 2, x minus 4. So we've created uh, an equation without any variables in the denominator. So by multiplying by the three unique factors, we've gotten rid of the denominators. Okay, it looks tedious and ugly the first time you do it, but after a while you can start to just kind of look at it and say oh that factor will get cancelled out but that factor will still be there and what you end up with is the unique um, do we not need a factor of x plus one over here Oh no, it canceled out. For x plus 1, since there's two of it, wouldn't Okay, from here we are solving. So now this is something that looks somewhat familiar. In order to solve this, you need to expand both sides, get all the information to one side, set it equal to zero, and then solve. And ideally we'll be able to use uh, factoring in order to solve, but in this case we won't. We'll have to use quadratic formula. But let's uh, step one, expand both sides. So we're foiling, basically. First times first here is x squared. Outside times outside is negative 1x. Inside times inside is negative 5x. That gives me negative 6x's plus 5. And then on the right, you've got 3x squared. And then the middle two terms combine to be negative 12x plus 2x, which is negative 10x and minus 8. Now we're going to bring all this over to one side. So I see that I have positive 3x squared over here. So I'm going to subtract my x squared. I'm going to uh, make the left side 0 here. So I'm going to end up with 0. And on the other side, I've got 3x squared minus x squared, which is 2x squared. I've got negative 10x minus negative 6x or negative 10x plus 6x would be negative 4x. And then I've got negative 8 minus 5, which is negative 13. This is not factorable, so we use quadratic formula. Not factorable. Use quadratic formula okay I'll set it up and then we're just gonna well, well work it all the way through I guess we'll use this part of the board here <laughs> quadratic formula says x equals negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a Sub in what we know. Negative, negative 4 is positive 4 plus or minus square root symbol. B squared is going to be 16 minus 4AC. Uh, 4 times 2 is 8 
times 13 would be 104. And we've got a negative factor, so that's going to be adding 104 all over 2a, which is just 4. or plus or minus the square root of 120 over 4. And now working with rational numbers. So we want to keep this in exact form. So we're not going to throw this in our calculator to get decimals. Instead, uh, we're going to see if we can pull a square number out of this side. Okay. Um, we can this is divisible by 4. So watch what happens to the radicand here under the, the whole square root, the whole radical here. It becomes square root of 4 times 30. Okay? And maybe I'll, I'll just do this part off to the side. This right. becomes 4 times 30 under the square root sign which is radical 4 times radical 30 radical 4 is 2 so you end up with 2 radical 30 okay that all goes back in here so now we have 4 plus or minus 2 radical 30 over 4 and now all of our terms are divisible by 2 so we can reduce this to 2 plus or minus radical 30 over 2. And that's an exact solution for this equation that we started with. Okay. So again, just running through the steps really quickly, we are going to factor the denominator, list all our restrictions. Uh, once you factor the denominator, you'll know the factors to multiply both sides by in order to eliminate any factors in the denominator. It's essentially the same thing we did up here, right? We didn't like this factor in the denominator, so we multiplied by it, both sides. Same thing here, we don't want any of these factors in the denominator, so we multiply by all of them. You don't have to do x plus one twice, you just have to take all the unique factors and multiply it and it'll cancel out. Once it's canceled out, you can simplify and expand and set it equal to zero. And in this case, we had to use the quadratic formula. Uh, the little trick using the quadratic formula is to do it carefully, but then also when you have this radical, you're looking for a square that you can uh, factor out in this case, we could uh, factor 120 into 4 times 30, square root of 4 is 2, and then all of these 1, 2, 3 terms are divisible by 2, so we could reduce it further. So in example 2, you have to solve uh, using technology. It's too complicated to solve uh, by hand, but in order to even use technology on that, you have to kind of simplify it a little bit and... Uh, give yourself a chance. So we've got x over x minus 2 on the left equals on the right 2x squared minus 3x plus 5 over x squared plus 6. Okay, so in order to get anything that we can put into a calculator or into Desmos, um, we check first if the denominators are factorable. X minus 2 is not factorable. X squared plus 6 is not factorable. Okay, so now what we're going to do is get that stuff out of the denominator. How? Well, we're going to multiply both sides by the product of these two denominators. So multiply both sides by X minus 2 times X squared plus 6. Now when you do that, on the left side, the x minus 2s are going to cancel out, and you'll be left with x times x squared plus 6. On the right, the x squared plus 6s are going to cancel out, 
and you'll be left with x minus 2 times this quadratic that's already there. Okay, now we can expand and simplify. So on this left side, we distribute the x to both terms. We get x cubed plus 6x. On the right side, we need to distribute both terms of the binomial and then come back and uh, group like terms. I'm just going to skip all of that and give you the resulting cubic, which is 2x cubed minus 7x squared plus 11x minus 10. So that would take you a couple of steps to get to. And now in order to uh, make it a solvable function using technology, we're going to just subtract uh, over here. So we're going to have 2x cubed minus x cubed. Subtract x cubed from both sides. And subtract 6x from both sides. So that equals 0. And now if you type that into your calculator, into your graphing calculator or into Desmos, uh, you're just going to type this whole side in y equals da 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 and then the solution is where and they could be multiple solutions is where this curve crosses the x axis so you would put in your calculator y equals x cubed minus 7x squared plus 5x minus 10 Okay, we ended up graphing this on Desmos. For those of you watching online, it looks something like that. And it crosses here at x equals 6.5. So that's the solution using technology. Okay, we're in our example four on 3.4 solve quadratic over a quadratic okay quadratic over a quadratic you can see that uh, you're solving x squared minus x minus 2 over x squared plus x minus 12 and the inequality is greater than or equal to 0 so our first step is to factor numerator and denominator Okay, we're going to factor the numerator and the denominator. The numerator, you're looking for two numbers that multiply to negative 2, add to negative 1. That becomes x plus 1, x minus 2. In the denominator, we have two numbers that add to positive 1, multiply to negative 12. That's going to be x plus 4, x minus 3, greater than or equal to 0. Okay, using our tips and tricks along the way, we're finding out from the numerator that our zeros, our zeros occur. Maybe I'll, yeah, I'll just keep going. Zeros occur from the numerator at x equals negative 1 and x equals 2. <clears throat> and then we have... From the denominator, our restrictions occur, which would be the uh, equations of our vertical asymptotes. So we have asymptote at x equals negative 4 and x equals 3. If you can't remember how to get those really quickly, then uh, you need to go back and review a little bit. Okay. So in order to break this up into its intervals, we want to know what's happening in certain places to see which intervals satisfy the inequality. And so our intervals come from 
our zeros and our restrictions, okay? So we're gonna draw ourselves a little number line here. Do you already have a number line? Yep. Okay, and our leftmost point of interest is x equals negative four. So the interval involved here is x less than negative four. And then we have what's happening at x equals negative four. And I'm gonna use a dotted line there just to represent uh, asymptote. And we have an asymptote at positive three as well. So this is x equals three. I'm probably not gonna go that deep because that's a waste of space. So we have this uh, interval, x greater than three. And then within there, we have our zeros. We have a zero at negative one. And we have a zero at positive two. And so we've split this into, this middle section has three different intervals, okay? We have an interval from negative four to negative one. We have an interval from negative one to positive two. And we have an interval from positive two to positive three. So here we have five different intervals to talk about, plus what happens at the uh, zeros, okay? We don't need to talk about what happens at the asymptotes. We know what happens. The function never crosses there. But we do need to talk about what happens at the zeros uh, because we're involved in a situation where we're looking for a greater than or equal to, okay? So all we're going to do is use the table and uh, we're going to make a table. Do you guys have a table drawn already? Yeah. That's really helpful. Does it have the intervals in it? No, it has the spot there and the real spot. Okay. So we're gonna use the table, and we're gonna consider all of these factors, one, two, three, four, and we're just gonna figure out if this whole thing is positive, negative, or zero in each of these five intervals, okay? So you've got your intervals. Our first interval is going to be from negative infinity to negative four, okay? Our next interval is gonna be from negative four to negative one. Negative one is a zero, so we wanna know what's happening there. Then we're gonna go from negative one to positive two. We're gonna figure out what's at positive two because that's a zero. Then we're gonna go from two to three. And then we're gonna look at what happens to the right of three. And in your next column, we have test points. So your test point for these intervals is any number within that interval. So from negative four to negative infinity, the easiest number to work with is probably negative five. You can just go through and pick the easiest uh, test point and it's gonna be x equals each time. x equals negative two in that interval. This is really easy. If x equals negative one, it has to be negative one. Uh, here we could choose x equals 0, x equals 2 we don't get to choose, x equals 2.5 is right in between 2 and 3, and x equals 4 is the easiest one in that last interval. In the next column, we are taking our rational equation our rational expression right here on the left hand side and we're basically going to simplify it into positives and negatives so we're looking at the signs of and if you if i guess i can write it in looking at the signs of each of the factors x plus one x minus two in the top x plus four x minus three in the bottom Okay, so basically when we put in our test value, what happens to each of these factors? And then in our last column, 
we're basically just going to count the negative factors and see if the overall expression sine of x plus 1, x minus 2, over x plus 4, x minus 3. Okay, so again, regrouping. What's the point? We want to know what the function is doing in each of these intervals. So we've listed each of our intervals. We chose a point within them. This is going to tell us whether at that test point, this interval is either positive or negative. It's either above the x-axis or below the x-axis. Okay. Same with this interval, same with this interval, this interval, this interval. So first we're going to write down the sign of each factor. Then from that, we're going to determine the sign of the overall function, if it's positive or negative. Okay, here we go. So we put in negative 5 into each of these factors. We end up x plus 1 ends up being negative. So the only thing we need to write is a negative sign. Okay, we're not getting an exact value. We're just finding out if it's positive or negative in that interval. x minus 2, that's going to be negative. x plus 4, that's going to be negative. And x minus 3, that's going to be negative. Okay. So we find out that we have four negative factors. Negative times a negative is a positive. Divided by a positive is positive. So the function in this interval over here is actually going to be positive. Okay. Next interval, we're using the test point of negative two. The first bracket would be negative. Uh, the second one would be negative. And then we're over x plus 4, that's going to be positive, and x minus 3, that's going to be negative. We have three negative factors, which means it's negative at that point, okay? x equals negative 1. Look at what happens. In the numerator, you get one factor of 0. 0 times anything is 0. 0 divided by anything is 0. So this one ends up being 0, okay? If you wanted to write out the factors, I'll do it this time just so that we can see it. This first factor becomes 0. The next factor is negative. Uh, in the denominator, you have positive times negative, but none of that matters because there's a zero in the numerator, so it's zero, okay? In our next section, our test point is x equals zero. So we're going to go through. I'm just going to erase that one to give myself more space. It's zero, so it's whatever is in there is going to be the sign. So the first one's positive, second one's negative, over, positive, negative, Two negative factors, a negative over a negative, that's positive. So you can see you have a change of sign at x equals negative 1. <clears throat> then we have a test value of 2, that one's going to end up being 0 for the same reason that negative 1 was 0. Then for in between 2 and 3 we chose the test point 2.5. So we've got positive, 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 negative. One negative factor makes the whole thing negative. And then a test point of four, they're all going to be positive. Every factor is going to be positive, so it's positive. If you do this right, you can kind of see the pattern that happens if you're working from left to right on your number line. You end up with all of them, in this case, all of them being one sign, then one of them switched, then a second one switched, then a third one switched, then they're all positive, okay? So if you've done it right, that is generally what will happen as you work across the intervals. Okay, what did that actually tell us? Um, basically, it just told us where this function is positive, negative, or zero. So basically, we can see where our inequality is satisfied. So from the table, we can say, therefore, therefore, the solution and maybe I'll write it actually under my table. The solution is you're going to write it in three different ways we're going to write it in, in as inequality 
then in interval notation, then as a number line so that you know how to do all three, okay? Interval notation looks like this. So we're basically going to include all the points that are zero or positive. So there's a positive, there's a, oh, this whole thing is gonna be all one, and there's a positive, okay? So the solution as an in, as a inequality first is everything to the left of negative four. So x less than negative four. Anything from negative one to two inclusive. So negative one and then a x is greater than or equal to and then is less than or equal to two. And then anything to the right of three but not including three. So x greater than three. As uh, interval notation, that means round and square brackets, we would say x belongs to the set of numbers from negative infinity to negative four. And then we're gonna go from negative one to positive two, but we're gonna include those. So we have the union of, and then square brackets, because it's inclusive, negative one to positive two, or from three to positive infinity, excluding three. And the last way we can show it is on a number line. On the number line, I would mark our key points so we have uh, four, sorry, negative four. You've got negative one, you've got two, and you've got three. Yours can be prettier if you want. Uh, but basically we can read this, so we've got anything to the left of negative 4 and not including negative 4, so that's an open dot, and then everything to the left of negative 4. Then we have from negative 1 to positive 2 inclusive, so that's going to be a solid dot at both of those points, and a solid line in between. And then we have uh, to the right of 3 not including 3, so that's an open dot. If you're not sure what these things are called, this is a solution as inequalities, interval, notation, and number line. Again, running through the steps really quick. Uh, you have a complicated quadratic over a quadratic. As part of the inequality, factor top and bottom to get your key points uh, along your x value. So you get your zeros and you get your asymptotes. From there, you build your table of values. You find out uh, a test point within each interval. Test each factor within each interval using that test point. Determine the sign of the whole uh, expression and then you can just circle your solutions, determine which intervals actually serve as solutions represented as uh, this. This they don't normally call this, like express your answer as an inequality. This would just be the solution. This is the solution in interval notation. This is number line. Carry on, carry on. That is the end of uh, 3.4. Do you guys have a graph there or no? No, good.